Civic learning is an important component of higher education. Local, regional, and national civics impact citizens' lives, so integrating civic learning in the college classroom can assist student citizens in exploring how these different levels of civics are interconnected and integral to a healthy democracy and why they're meaningful to students' lives. In this workshop, we'll be introduced to some strategies for integrating civic learning into your courses in relevant and meaningful ways. Some strategies discussed might include classroom instruction in civics, service learning, experiential learning, models and simulations of democratic processes, guided classroom discussion of topical issues, and participation in school governance. I am your presenter today. I am um, Amanda Smothers. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. Um, and I'll, I can take questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. So if you have any specific questions related to what we're covering during the presentation, just feel free to post that to the chat thread. I'll address them as they come up. So in the text, just uh, text chat, just tell me what your department is um, or your division, what's your role, and then what do you hope to get out of this workshop? And this is a good first uh, class period. So if you're doing a synchronous class online, um, you know, first class period kind of brief icebreaker as well. Um, and something else that I like to do <clears throat> at the beginning of synchronous classes is to have students share an emoji in the chat. Um, so just this is just a kind of fun check in um, if they're not feeling up to, you know, typing anything extensive. This just kind of gives you sort of helps you gauge, you know, how your students are, are doing, how the class might go, why um, they might be impacted by um, certain things. Um, okay, so chemistry and biochemistry, research assistant, have um, you've done TA work before, might again. Um, civics aren't necessarily a big part of chemistry, but they're neglected in lower education, um, so it's a good idea to try and integrate it where possible. Definitely. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so if you have an emoji, you can share that. You can search for emojis um, too and collaborate, which is nice. It's a lot of fun because then you can find the right one. So there's my, my little dog emoji for my, my dogs. So it's just kind of a fun little way to break the ice at the beginning of a class um, and to make sure that everybody's there engaged. Um, all right, so our workshop objectives, and if you want to share an emoji, feel free. Um, so in this workshop, we'll discover some practical strategies for how to define civic engagement, explain the relevance of civic learning to higher education, identify the benefits of civic learning, connect civic learning outcomes to your course goals, discover strategies to integrate civic learning in your courses in and out of the classroom, and address some challenges of civic learning. So the first topic that we'll cover is civic engagement in general, including what civic engagement is and how we can approach civic engagement holistically. I just wanted to share a brief um, quote that I thought kind of encompasses uh, civic education and its importance. Um, so civic education coursework should include opportunities for students to engage as citizens now, rather than focusing on how they may engage as citizens in the future. Um, so this is that meaning making. 
in civic education. So not just teaching students about civics um, and how they might be able to use it at some point in the distant future as quote unquote adults, um, but they're citizens right now. So how can they engage as citizens right now? And I thought that was important to um, creating meaning for students and also getting them really engaged with civic education. This is a model of civic engagement from the University of Minnesota Extension. Um, and according to them, at the heart of civic, effective civic engagement is processes that support genuine discussion, reflection, and collaboration. And for them, discussion includes both dialogue and deliberation. Uh, dialogue is discussion to promote understanding, and it is deliberation. Deliberation is discussion aimed at reaching a decision. Um, and this all involves skills in listening, questioning, and framing, which are important to civic engagement process. So the model begins with a public issue, and then it moves to conveners. Um, so these would be the students and community preparing to address the issue. The process involves launching an inquiry, clarifying the issue, analyzing, identifying options, synthesizing data, making resourceful decisions, acting together to address the issue, and then finally enacting change. So here is University of Minnesota Extension's holistic approach to civic engagement. And for them, it, it consists of five stages, which are to prepare, inquire, analyze, synthesize, and act together. Um, prepare involves understanding the context in which the issue is going to be addressed to assess community readiness. Um, and it ends with the decision to launch work on that issue using civic engagement, so public discussion, reflection, collaboration. Um, the inquire stage involves conducting dialogue to better understand all of the aspects of the issue. And the, pre uh, the presenting issue is explored, clarified to determine possible underlying issues, and then we have deliberation to frame that issue. The next stage is analyze, and that's where we're fostering dialogue to explore different perspectives and viewpoints and deepen our understanding of the issue. And we're also deliberating to generate options. Um, the fourth stage is synthesizing, so we're conducting dialogue to align the issue with the identified options, and then we deliberate to reach a decision and translate that decision into a plan of action. And then our final stage, stage five, is act together. And that is where we create trust or use that created trust, the trust that we've created, the relationships that we've created and, and solidified throughout the process to take some collective action to address the issue. So that's where we're implementing our plans. So that's just a um, little overview of, of civics in general. And so let's talk about civic learning in higher education specifically. Um, and in this section, we'll go over the purpose of higher education, the relevance of civic learning, and the benefits of a civic education. So first of all, what is the purpose of higher education? Um, one question, a sort of a focusing question that I thought was helpful is, are we doing enough to help students articulate the value of college beyond employment and income outcomes? Um, and this is from uh, the, an article titled The True Purpose of a College Education, in which Stephen Mintz asks some probing questions that get to the heart of the purpose of education. And I'm just going to focus on one one question, the question that's on the screen, are we doing enough to help students articulate the value of college beyond its employment and income outcomes? Um, and that seems to be sort of the, the primary focus of discussions around higher education. Um, so how does it get you a job? How does it, you know, earn you a higher income? Um, and Mintz says that if most graduates think that a college education's essential value lies in career preparation, then we're doing a poor job of explaining our broader objectives, which are to produce culturally literate, well-rounded adults who are knowledgeable about the arts, the humanities, and the social, behavioral, and natural sciences, who can think critically, communicate effectively, argue logically, and solve complex problems. 
So what is the relevance of civic learning? Um, this quote is from um, the ECS Clearinghouse. It's a, there's, they have a document, a guide um, on civic learning. And they say the necessary elements of effective civic education include classroom instruction in civics and government, history, economics, law, and geography, service learning linked to classroom learning, experiential learning, learning through participation in models and simulations of democratic processes, guided classroom discussion of current issues and events, and meaningful participation in school governance. Um, so within this guide, the uh, organizations that compiled the guide argue that civic education has been diluted over the years. It's put, been pushed to the back burner in deference of more intense accountability systems in things like math and science and English language arts. Um, so in they talk about how in 2003, there was this effort to help reinvigorate civic education with the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Center for um, Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. And that initiative um, convened a diverse and dedicated group of civic thinkers to brainstorm strategies for how we might re revitalize civic education. Um, and they developed uh, this set of six promising practices for effective learning, civic learning, that is designed to help teachers create civic curricula. Um, and so within this document, which we'll take a look at um, at the end of the presentation um, and kind of well, what it involves, um, but it, it gives sort of a definition of what that practice is, that's one of each one of the six practices is, what's the research behind it, and what are some examples of how it's being done, and what are some resources for further um, examination. Um, and they say that this, the necessary elements, as it says on the screen, the necessary elements of civic education include, and these are the kind of these six guides, um, it's that classroom instruction piece, it's the service learning, it's the experiential learning, it's the participation in models and simulations, it's that guided classroom discussion, and it's that meaning, meaningful participation. Um, the authors of The Guardian of Democracy believe that the well-being of our body politic is best served by an informed, engaged citizenry that understands how and why our system of government works. And civic quality civic education not only increases citizen knowledge and engagement, but also expands civic equality, improves 21st century skills, and may reduce the dropout rate and improve school climate. So that's the relevance of civic learning. Um, and also some of the benefits of civic learning. Um, other benefits of civic learning, according to the McCormick Foundation, includes high quality school-based civic learning um, that fosters civic knowledge, skills, and attitudes, promotes civic equality, builds those 21st century skills, improves the school climate, as we heard, and lowers school dropout rates. Um, so for each one of those things, um, so fosters civic knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Um, School-based civic learning broadens and deepens our civic knowledge. It hones our civic skills. It nurtures our civic attitudes, which collectively helps to prepare our students to become informed, effective participants in our democracy. Um, the second point promotes, promotes civic equality. Voter turnout is highest among white, affluent, highly educated Americans. Um, and universally available civic learning opportunities help to close that empowerment gap. So that's how it would promote civic equality. Um, and it also builds 21st century skills. So students in traditional and interactive civics lessons work well with others, they're economically knowledgeable, they're media literate, and they're also aware of current events through their civic education. Um, it also helps to improve school climate through these engagement activities, um, our students connect with the community. They learn respect, um, respectful dialogue and teamwork. They learn how to appreciate diversity. Um, and then finally, it lowers dropout rates. Um, 
so these real world civic learning opportunities like service learning, like experiential learning, help improve students' chances of staying in school as well. Um, it's that connection piece, that sense of belonging and relationship that's so important to persistence. All right, so next we'll go over some specific ways to integrate civic learning in and out of the classroom. Um, first, we'll cover civic learning outcomes and we'll explore a few specific strategies for incorporating civic learning in your courses. And these options will include classroom instruction in civics, guided classroom discussion of topical issues, models and simulations of democratic processes, service learning, experiential learning, civic online reasoning, and participation in school governance. So first of all, civic learning outcomes. Um, the, um, there's Tufts Student Learning um, has a student learning outcomes document, um, which I will share um, at the end of the presentation, the link to that. But it has three specific um, categories of outcomes, and then it has um, different domains and then specific outcomes for each of those domains. And I won't go into too much detail on this. Um, we'll just kind of go over the domains and then you can definitely check out um, that um, resource for more specific um, outcomes. So it's got the outcome for each domain and then it's got examples of how you might implement that outcome in your class too. Um, so we've got civic knowledge, and within that, knowledge, comprehension, analysis, and th synthesis. We've got civic skills. That involves planning or implement implementation, communication, leadership, cultural competency, and evaluation. And then finally, we have civic values, and that's grounding, responding, and committing. And let me just open quickly. Um, the document just to give you an idea of one of these. Um, so we'll talk about the first one, civic knowledge, which develops intellectual abilities to engage in building dem democratic societies. The domain, the first domain is knowledge. Um, outcomes for that domain recognizes or recalls information, concepts, and theories that are essential to build democratic societies. So some examples um, of how you might um, parse those parse those outcomes um, out for your course might be describes theories and concepts of community, describes democratic change theories, including asset-based approaches, understand contribution of academic discipline to democratic societies, knows theories of ethical reasoning, recognizes the role of citizens, government, NGOs, and the private sector in building democratic societies. Um, and then the second category is civic skills. That's where he uh, demonstrates proficiency in the skills of active citizenship through training or experience. Um, and then civic values is possesses motivations, values, and ethics to effectively participate in building democratic societies. Um, so you can take a look at that document, um, which will be shared. It's called Student Civic Learning Outcomes. Um, and take a look at how you might incorporate these civic learning outcomes into your class. So where might they align with your subject matter? Um, and you know, in some subjects that might be easier, political science, super easy, um, but how can you incorporate that, for example, into a chemistry course, um, which might be a little bit more difficult, but I think possible. All right, so the first um, way to implement civic instruction um, or civic education is classroom instruction in civics. Um, and with this, we wanna provide instruction in government history, law, and democracy. And according to ECS, um, So we don't have, you know, the, there used to be a time when just a semester of U.S. government with, the, you know, learning the dates and events, some cursory discussions about what caused revolutions or uprisings. Um, there was a time that that was considered enough to prepare young people for productive participation in a democratic world. Um, but 
civic education is more effective if it's integrated into all components of our curricula, um, not just a requirement for, you know, one class that you have to take to graduate from high school. Um, so a more holistic approach would allow students more time to delve into the heart of those issues and the ripple effect that those issues on, um, have on society as a whole. Um, so for example, uh, they provide the example that it's not enough just to know how our government is structured. Um, if we want our, our students to be drawn into uh, or drawn to lives of civic engagement, they need time to examine things like why our government system works the way it does um, and the challenges inherent in that system. Um, so do also due to the, the current extremely polarized political climate in America, students can benefit from, from that discord by examining those complexities of our system and how to look objectively at different sides of issues. And that might help with that polarization. If we can see that there's more than two polarized opposites, um, they can see the gray area, they can see the complexities of that. Um, also, lecture has, you know, a place in our, our repertoire as, as educators, um, but we don't just want to talk at students in our classroom instruction. Um, students are tech savvy, they can use digital media, they can use internet research, uh, large and small group presentations, personal interviews um, to meet our objectives in, in civic learning in the classroom. Um, so we want to maybe give them a micro lesson on something and then have them do a little bit more digging and present to the class, for example, on what they've learned. Also, um, political knowledge is an important precondition for civic participation. Um, so we need to incorporate that political knowledge into any aspect of our students' curriculum that um, you know, we can so that it has that positive impact on their civic knowledge and um, will help uh, propel them towards civic participation eventually, which is the goal. All right, so this kind of goes into our next topic, which is guided classroom discussion of topical issues. Um, so one of those um, six strategies for effective civic learning is to incorporate discussion of current local, national, international issues and events in the classroom, um, particularly those that our students view as important to their lives um, or relevant to their lives. or you know, maybe they don't view them as important to their lives, but how can we make them relevant to their lives? How can we show them that it is important to their lives and it does affect them? Um, for example, the um, Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. How can we make that um, relevant? Um, and there are, you know, within all, um, not all, but within a lot of current events, you know, you can pull things out that are relevant to different um, to different uh, subject matters. So, you know, we might talk about um, history of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine and the former Soviet Union, um, or in you know a more STEM-based class, you can talk about um, Chernobyl um, and how you know, Russian forces are close to Chernobyl. There's this, there's a danger around um, the nuclear waste there. Um, so there are different angles, different ways to approach it that are relevant to different subject areas. Um, so one thing that civic learning curricula fail to include sometimes is controversial is issues. Um, so as a result of that, our students might not learn how to engage productively with those issues and events that animate um, our political system um, and you know will do so as we move on in, into the future. Um, so part of the goal of these guided classroom discussions of these topical issues is to get students to engage with diversity of thought 
uh, to appreciate others' perspectives, understand the value of living in a place where differing views are embraced. Um, you know, and we can talk about uh, Russia with that as well, where, you know, the, the state media um, controls the narrative of what's happening in Ukraine um, and anything that's outside of that narrative is being quashed. Um, so compare that to, you know, American media where there are multiple different viewpoints um, that you can access. Um, so also, if we address those difficult issues, we can kind of try to demystify those conflicting beliefs and help students approach um, these controversial issues with maybe some more object objectivity. Um, so getting them to see that thinking differently is not wrong or bad, um, which is not always the message that they get, um, per particularly, you know, if they come from a background of very strong, you know, polarized belief. Um, so when we engage students in the civic discourse, we give them the opportunity to practice researching current issues in their, their local communities, in our country, um, in the world, and then coming up with some feasible solutions. They can share what they've learned in, in a variety of ways. Um, and, you know, these issues, these current um, contentious issues, can really serve as a basis for, for powerful civic learning experiences for students that are relevant to them, not just talking about you know, historical events, um, but things that are happening right now. Another G um, is to use models and simulations of democratic processes. Um, so we provide, as a part of this, um, opportunities for students to participate in simulations of democratic processes. So that might be a mock election, moot court, problem solving, um, consideration of dilemmas. It'd be an interactive case study, a scenario, an online game, um, something that allows students to learn about issues and practice civic skills in multiple disciplines by, um, we wanna reserve sufficient time for each simulation. So we give our students the opportunity to learn those challenging skills and concepts and build background knowledge. We wanna discuss how the lessons that they've learned in that simulation might apply in other contexts. So we wanna be able to transfer what they've learned, um, including in local communities and society, and then build on students' life experiences and knowledge of democratic structures and institutions and create time for students to reflect and to process uh, so they understand the concepts um, and the application of whatever the, the simulation is um, that they've just taken part in. So mock trials and elections are some popular traditional ways to use um, models and simulations of democratic processes. Um, they provide a lot of benefits. There is increased civic knowledge, there's teamwork, analytic thinking, public speaking, and so on. But aside from those established, you know, the mock trials, the elections, technology can play a meaningful role in the classroom as well. Um, they can simulate a professional work environment, for example, by trading emails, planning meetings, conducting research. Um, there are online games that offer a range of civic learning opportunities like iCivics. Um, that you know also provide real-time feedback um, and do a good job of gamifying uh, the learning experience for students holding their attention. And in addition to you know the obvious benefit of increasing student civic knowledge, they learn skills that apply to both civic and non-civic contexts. They learn public speaking, teamwork, close reading, analytical thinking. Um, the ability to argue both sides of the topic as well. Um, and also, you know, there's evidence that indicates that simulations of voting, of trials, um, of legislative deliberation, of diplomacy in schools can lead to heightened political knowledge and interest as well. Um, another way to um, promote civic learning 
is service learning. Um, so service learning is credit bearing educational experience where students participate in some sort of organized service activity that meets some identified community need. And then they reflect on that service activity in such a way as to gain further understanding of course content, a broader appreciation of the discipline and an enhanced uh, sense of, of civic responsibility. Um, so how can service learning contribute to civic learning? Engaged learning is basically a gateway to the desired outcomes of college that I talked about. Um, so students who engage more frequently in educationally purposeful activities, both in and out of the classroom, get better grades, they're more satisfied, and they're more likely to persist and graduate. Um, so some impact of service learning, um, some data that came out of, of this um, from ECS, or from ScholarWorks, sorry, um, was that first year students and seniors who reported a service learning experience had significantly higher levels of engagement on the following than students who did not do service learning. So they were more engaged um, on active and collaborative learning, asking questions in class, working with peers on assignments, making presentations. They were also uh, more engaged with student faculty interaction, so talking about career plans, discussing assignments, um, prompt feedback. And then finally, they were more engaged on diversity experience. So serious conversation with students on uh, difference and race and ethnicity with different beliefs um, and perception that um, school encourages contact among students with different backgrounds. So in sum, for service learning, it's a unique teaching and learning strategy. Um, it encourages students to use academic knowledge and skills to find viable solutions to real community needs. Um, it's not really a packaged curriculum. Um, no two service learning projects are going to be completely alike, and they're going to depend on uh, the goals of your course, the outcomes of your course, and how you want to um, help students learn that course content while engaging in civic learning um, in a service learning uh, experience. And then making that connection between our academic objectives and service to community, we can accomplish that in a couple of different ways. Um, we can start with the service project and identify curricular objectives that align with that project, or we can determine specific learning objectives and then work with students to find a service project that will help them meet those objectives. Um, so we either start with the project and then align it to our objectives or we um, to de determine which objectives we want to meet and then work with our students to find a project that's going to help them meet those objectives. So that gives them a little bit of ownership over it too. And the more that students are involved in the process of selecting um, and planning their project, the more likely they are to buy into it. <clears throat> All right, experiential learning is another option. Um, so experiential learning opportunities include things like uh, engaging in action civics, and that's where students learn about and take action on issues in their communities um, or serving as poll workers or participating in student governance or school or district based decision making. And that offers students authentic ways to explore democracy and behave as civic uh, actors. So according to research, um, you know, there, there, there are those six promising practices or six proven practices. Um, of civic learning that are effective. Um, so we've, we've talked about a few of them. Experiential learning is one of them. And since most extracurricular activities take place outside of the traditional classroom setting, students have opportunities to study in an environment where they can apply what they learn in class to those real life contexts. So that's um, one way uh, through experiential learning that we can get students to see how what they're learning in the classroom is applicable to the broader world. So they don't just, you know, 
think it's it's only applicable in this class and then I can forget about it. Um, so they can use that knowledge, they can use those skills in meaningful scenarios. <clears throat> and then for a lot of our students, participating in those extracurricular activities gives them a sense of self-efficacy, it gives them a feeling that they're part of something important. Um, and they have a strong sense of self and what they have to offer and that those feelings um, lead them to be more likely to find positive ways to contribute to their communities and society. All right, civic online reasoning um, is more important than ever. Uh, this is from um, Stan Civic Online Reasoning at Stanford. And there's a part of it um, by Sam Weinberg, who's the founder and faculty director of Stanford History Education Group, um, called Our Democracy is at Risk. Um, and in that part, he talks about how um, he cites University of Connecticut professor Michael Lynch, who calls the internet quote, both the world's best fact checker and the world's best bias confirmer, often at the same time. Um, and Weinberg says that he's come to believe that reliable information is to civic health what clean water and proper sanitation are to public health. Um, so we have so much information at our fingertips today, never more than ever before. Um, but whether that makes us smarter and better informed or more ignorant and narrow-minded depends on our educational response to that challenge. So um, we think of our students as digital natives. Um, and Weinberg argues that, you know, they may be able to flip between different social media platforms while uploading and texting a friend all at the same time. But when it comes to the important part, the evaluating of the information, they're actually easily duped. Um, so they did a survey with students from middle school to college that showed the depth of that challenge. And 82% of middle school students mistook advertisements for news. Um, high school students took an image posted anonymously on a photo sharing site as evidence of the ecological effects of a nuclear disaster. And college students rated a splinter group of pediatricians labeled a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center as more reliable than 60, a 64,000 member American Academy of Pediatrics. So what they found was that a lot of the ideas that students brought to the internet, such as be suspicious of .com URLs, but trust.orgs, haven't been true since dial-up modems were used to get online. And so those, these things are informing how students perceive information. Um, so Stanford has a civic online reasoning, COR, curriculum that's based on strategies that they identified when observing those fact checkers um, from the nation's most prestigious news organizations. Um, so they've done a lot of research, years of research and field testing, um, and they have an ongoing collaboration with the Pointer Institute and the, uh, their participating in MediaWise initiative with support from Google. Um, so resources on their website were tested in real classrooms. Um, they've got a lot of different resources, uh, sample lesson plans and assessments, for example. Um, and teaching students those skills, they he warns, aren't going to professional fact checkers, but it'll take a bite out of those common errors that students make. Um, and he says, quote, our students are speeding along the information superhighway without a license. Before letting them loose, let's at least make sure that they've passed the driver's test. Um, so I think that's probably one of the most uh, salient things, one of the most important things um, is to make sure that our students are, are digitally literate um, and that they have civic online reasoning skills so that they don't get duped by incorrect information. Oops. Um, so finally, participation in school governance. Um, students can participate in school governance in a lot of different contexts. They can join the student council. They can join advisory boards, um, department committees. 
Um, just to name a few, some department committees allow, you know, undergraduates, graduates to join. Um, and a lot of students, they do have good ideas on how to improve their schools. They're the ones who are experiencing it. Um, and they would take action if they were given the opportunity to make a change that is important to them. So they should be allowed to practice those, those skills, those civic skills within that controlled environment of the classroom, within school walls, um, or within the campus climate, where they can learn from the challenges and triumphs, responses, failures, um, which are all the realities of the democratic process. So um, those who know how to make their voices heard at, at school uh, within the campus climate are going to be better equipped to be active and effective in their communities at large. Uh, so students can learn and practice skills necessary for effective citizenship in a context that can have real and lasting impacts on their school community. Um, and those impacts include better academic success and engagement, um, a higher likelihood of civic participation in the future, including voting, higher test scores, a higher likelihood to volunteer, um, to participate in campaigns, other political activities. Um, and for students who attend schools where they feel that their student voice is honored, there's a higher likelihood that they're going to be trusting and civically engaged later in life. So the last part of the workshop, I just want to go over some of the challenges facing civic education, take a look at a specific resource, um, and see a list of the resources that I used to develop this workshop. There will also be an opportunity for you to ask any questions before we close out today's workshop, if you have any. So challenges of civic education. Um, so in her essay, The Challenges Facing Civic Education in the 21st Century, Kathleen Hall Jameson lays out five fundamental challenges confronting reformers that are trying to improve the quality and accessibility of civic education in schools. Um, and the first is that ensuring civic education is high quality hasn't been a state or a federal priority, which is kind of hard to, to overcome. Um, Second is that social studies textbooks don't facilitate the development of needed civic skills. Third is that upper income students are better served by our schools. Um, and obviously this is K-12, both generally and specifically in regard to civic education than our lower income individuals. Um, fourth, cutbacks in funds available to schools make implementing changes in civics education difficult. And then finally, the polarized political climate, climate increases the likelihood that Curricular changes will be cast um, as advancing a partisan agenda. And we've seen this, um, you know, recently with um, uh, Florida passing the Don't Say Gay bill, um, with, um, you know, critical race theory being on sort of the hot seat uh, and misinterpreted, misconstrued, misrepresented. Um, so, you know, these are all things that we can talk about. Um, Reform efforts are complicated also by the fact that civic education can be overlooked on the national stage and that education leaders send mixed messages. So some support the idea of quality civic education as crucial to the foundation of our democracy, um, but authentic support for that civic education doesn't always follow in many states. Um, and students in states that do support civic education often only get one shot at an American government class, and that's in either the 11th or the 12th grade um, that's required for them to graduate. So that signals that civics is an afterthought. It doesn't allow students to build their knowledge, to integrate that knowledge into multiple um, disciplines um, and, and examine how civics um, is woven through every facet of education. But those six proven practices um, that we've gone over for effective learning, civic learning, help students grasp that understanding of an appreciation of how our democracy works. It allows them to examine and participate in a holistic manner. And it's not just we need we need to allow students the opportunity to practice um, civic learning, not just receive civic learning. So it's not enough to just teach 
selected pieces about how our government works, they need to gain a deeper understanding. And the way that they do that is by examining the unique relationship between history, government, law, and democracy, how they work together, how they support one another, why we have the system of government that we have, uh, what sacrifices our forefathers made to secure that system, what democracy actually means, and the crucial role that every American plays in sustaining that democracy. So just briefly, um, this is the resource that I wanted to highlight, and this is from the guidebook, um, Six Proven Practices for Effective Civic Learning. Um, so these are the six practices uh, that we've gone over today, provide instruction in government, history, law, and democracy, incorporate discussion of current local, national, and international issues and events in the classroom, particularly those that young people view as important in their lives, design and implement programs that provide students with opportunities to apply what they learn through performing community service that's linked to the formal curriculum and classroom instruction, um, so that's that service learning, Offer extracurricular activities that provide opportunities for young people to get involved in their schools and communities. That's the experiential learning piece. Um, encourage student participation, participation in school governance and encourage students participation in simulations of democratic processes and procedures. So here is a list of the resources that I have used um, throughout this um, presentation, this, this workshop, um, to inform um, how I've developed um, integrating civic learning. Um, and I will send this out in a post email to um, my attendee here today. Um, but you can always come back to this, this uh, part of the recording if you want um, to search for these resources as well. So um, any questions at this point before we, we finish up for today? All right, great. So thank you so much for attending today's presentation and exploring with me how we can integrate civic learning in our courses to provide students with the knowledge, skills, and dispositions to be active, informed citizens.